My talk today is about, as I said, love. Uh, so we've had LV equals, and if you've ever seen uh, any of their advertising, you'll know that love is quite uh, core to their brand and quite important to the way they market themselves. And um, with Valentine's looming, I thought that with um, the world becoming more aware of you know, being kind and sharing and showing our love, I thought there are, there are many lessons that we can actually take from Valentine's Day and take from stories of love um, and actually think about then how that applies to us as businesses, us as marketeers and us as potentially business owners. Because um, there are similarities and we're all human beings at the end of the day and the connection of love brings us all together and uh, creates bonds. And I think if we are trying to communicate with our customers and our audiences, then just um, pumping out information and advertising which you know, in the last uh, 10 years has been completely transformed through digital, um, doesn't really work anymore. We do need to have a proper connection with the audiences, the people that we want to interact with, who want ultimately to buy our services and products. So what can we learn from love and what can we think about from those lessons and apply them to our businesses is, is where I'm going to take us in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Some of the things that uh, interest me in, um, and I think we all need to be aware of when we think about digital in 2015 is that we are certainly living more and more of our lives online. Uh, I, I would hasten a guess that probably 90% of you have got a social media profile of some sort, yes? Uh, maybe you have multiple social media profiles, yes? And you probably have a smartphone or a tablet device that you use to access the internet either in your pocket or at home. Lots of people nodding heads again, excellent. So increasingly the, the internet is this thing that pervades our life, not necessarily in a box that we sit in front of and, and interact with with keys. It's a thing we can touch and scroll and zoom and pinch and, and carry with us. So it's, uh, it's very, very important. And that means that our digital footprints as individuals, again, are increasing every single minute of the day almost. You know, that some of the tweets that we've had today, which has been fantastic, just is another footprint in our digital world that we're leaving behind us. Um, so that's a trend that um, I don't think really enough businesses are, are taking to their advantage. And again, I touch on some of that. Um, connectivity is definitely on the increase. Um, I mentioned earlier on about having 4G here, which is fantastic. But Wi-Fi is much more prevalent. If you go to some places in America, they have free Wi-Fi in, in towns. And you can connect almost at any point at any time. Um, so we're used to this world now of not only living more, more online, but actually being able to do the things that we want to thanks to the connectivity and technology around. And I think because of all of this transformation and all of this uh, living our lives online and using digital media, the, the, the ownership piece that was quite big uh, over the last century is slowly diminishing. And again, some stats on that. What I mean by ownership is possession. We don't really need possession. We don't need to acquire things. We can just use them as and when we want to. And that's quite an important thing that people uh, have a, got used to, whether it's a young or an, even an older audience. And so because of all those things, you know, us as a business, what we really believe in is that digital should be used to bring people together, uh, and brands should be using digital as much as possible to inspire their audiences, inspire their customers, and hopefully connect to them on an, some sort of emotional level rather than transactional level, which is what we currently see um, most of the time. So our, our mission as Adido is to make the lives of people happier using digital technologies. And again, I'll talk about some things here. So we are living all of our lives more online. It's not just um, the young audience, which again is sometimes the perception. If you look at the graphs around uh, age usage of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook is used by pretty much every demographic, every age. Um, some of the younger ones like Twitter and Snapchat are used primarily by the younger audiences uh, and LinkedIn again tends to be flat. So regardless of age, those people are online. If we look at the information that's produced by us as digital people, the, the growth is mind-blowing mind uh, basically. Um, if you look at the graph, since social media really tipped into the mainstream about five, six years ago, You've just seen the amount of information created and stored um, each year just go um, up and up and up and up. And that's, that's fueled, as I say, by a growth in connectivity. So when people tend to have uh, data on their phones, this is 2010, by the way. This is only five years ago. 
we were not really using a lot of data to connect to the internet. And then the iPhone launched, and then we had Android, and blah de blah de blah. And now we're at a point where the amount of information we consume on our phones now means that the phone is not really a good definition for the device that's in your pocket. It's more of a, a smart computer, because how many people actually use their phone to phone people? Not that many. It's an ironic term. It should really be called something else. Uh, and the, what, what, as I say, one of those things is, is Wi-Fi, it's the usefulness of the technology. It's also to do with 4G as well. So if you look at 4G and when that's been available, again, we just seem to want to consume as much data as possible and we just rely on our phones uh, increasingly thanks to the speed of connectivity that we have. Uh, and then I talked about ownership, so some information and stats to back that up because it's always good to look at a nice graph. Um, Ownership is, I say, becoming redundant. This is my view personally, uh, one that I think the company shares, but it's also backed up by various bits of data. So if you look at um, music, physical music sales have been on a very sharp decrease in the last few years. Streaming of movies has grown significantly while DVDs has declined. People don't really buy newspapers anymore. They consume their news through social media or going onto websites like the Daily Mail, which we're going to hear from later on. Um, and people, you know, those tangible physical things that we used to spend our money and time purchasing and collecting or storing, we now really don't bother with. On the other side of the uh, thing, this is um, a, a company called Airbnb. Has anyone heard of them? Yeah. Most people. Um, so people have possessions and they have ownership of things, and now actually they're thinking about well, I can use my spare room when I go on holiday and rent that out. And this is the growth of Airbnb uh, number of users in the last uh, three or four years. It's absolutely mind-blowing. They've gone from something like a couple of hundred thousand about three, four, five years ago to now four million registered accounts. And people take a holiday using Airbnb. They don't book a hotel. So um, you don't even have to you know, own a particular thing. You, the asset that you have, you can use... use in, in many different ways. And I mentioned about using digital, you know, everyone talks about digital, isn't it such a great thing, aren't we lucky to live in such a, a world where we can connect to each other. Um, part of me with my race into glasses, you know, I can remember a day before the internet, just about, uh, and it seemed that people did talk more, and we had a life that we all inter interacted more, and we shared more, and we shared our emotions more, and we talked more, whereas the reality actually tends to be more like this. Where we have our screens and we tend to live in our own little world, which, you know, us as a company, we really want to try and change that, um, working with our clients to do so. So, has digital made our lives happier? Again, I'm trying to find some evidence to say yay or nay. Um, and certainly, has purchasing and consumers even helped us? I don't know. If we look at the GDP output from the UK in the last 40 years, we've, we've done very well as a country, so give ourselves a pat on the back. We've put outputting more and more and more. Yet, actually, are we more happy with our lives? tends to be pretty flat, everyone seems to be fairly okay, but maybe in the last few years, either we've galvanised ourselves because of the recession, or maybe technology is actually helping us slightly to live more satisfied lives. I'm still not quite sure where the line is. But if digital is sort of di dividing people or isolating people, then my challenge to you today is to think about digital and how do you use it to actually connect and create some more positive emotions uh, using the channels you have as a company, you as an individual, to, to share the love of of your company. So of all the ones and noughts out there, I think we should be trying to send some love out in the digital world and this should be try and be you. So that brings me on to lots of different stories about love uh, and then trying to think about how we can use some of those connections we have as people to Im improve the digital um, marketing that we do because ultimately love makes the world go around. Ah, oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> so some stories. Um, Number one is uh, flowers. This is a story about flowers. Does anyone have any idea about who this guy is? No, neither did I. Until a few months ago, I got uh, recommended by a book by actually an ex-employee of ours. Uh, and this guy is called Ben Horowitz. He wrote a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, uh, <laughs> which is a very good title. And in his book, he talks about his... Um, life as an entrepreneur in the last 15 years. Ben Horowitz 
um, was fortunate enough, because um, I think he was hugely intelligent as well, um, to work with a guy um, who started a, a web browser called a Mosaic. Has anyone ever heard of that? It was one of the first ever web browsers publicly available, and it used to charge people to buy uh, the Mosaic browser, and then uh, one day Microsoft decided they were going to release Internet Explorer for free. And all of a sudden, the Mosaic browser business went, went pop. Um, so he went on to then form a company with that guy, uh, I think it's called Mark Andreessen, um, creating web hosting services which were cloud-based. And he, he worked in a company called Loud Cloud, got lots and lots of funding, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and the company was doing really, really well, end of the 1990s. And then about 2001, the dot-com uh, dot com bubble happened. And the company literally went from a share price of hundreds of millions of dollars down to, I think, about 25 million within about three or four months. This whole industry had been sort of blowing itself up for a number of months and years. Uh, and then when all their competitors went pop, or nearly went pop, Mark saw some opportunity in the loud cloud system, and they had some very good IP, which they then took out and created a separate company called Opsware. But while he was on that journey, he neglected his family. He neglected his wife, uh, all of the connections, all the friends, all of the support he'd had. He got so obsessed with his business and trying to make his business work. He was spending 60, 70, 80 hours every week, sometimes working two or three days in a row, non-stop, trying to get this business to where he wanted it. He was so extremely passionate about it that he forgot about his life. He forgot about his personal life. He forgot about his interactions with the people that mattered to him. Uh, and he had a, a, a discussion with his dad on the phone. He said, Dad, well, this business is not going really well. You know, I'm not quite sure what to do. Should I sell? Should I just abort and try and do something else? He said, well, what does your wife think? Well, I don't know. I've not spoken to my wife for several days. <laughs> and he said, Ben, do you know what's, what's really expensive? And he said, no, Dad, what's really expensive? Divorce. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that, Dad, yeah. He said, do you want to know what's really cheap? And it's flowers. <laughs> Buy your wife some flowers, look after her, because she's going to look after you if you let her. And so he neglected to look after the most important person in his world. He went home, he bought some flowers, and he tried to spend more time with his wife and his family and his kids. And he did manage to get some sort of work-life balance. I think he's a bit of a maniac working a lot of hours. Um, but he got to a point where he was very, very happy, and you know, this cheap... A relatively cheap gift actually showed that his wife that he actually cared. So what's the story that I think we can take from that? Well, number one thing um, is that digital marketing doesn't have to be expensive. People think that I always have to try and acquire new customers. When we speak to our customers or our clients and talk about what's your digital objectives, I need to get X amount of new customers and new clients. But then one thing we always tend to forget is the existing clients that we've got and trying to look after them as much as possible. Us as a company are trying to make an, quite a significant investment this year in, in spending more time with our existing clients and making sure that we understand them better and look after them. And one of the best ways that we can look after and communicate with our existing customers is email. Email has always been kicked in the sort of um, curb in the last few years when people always talk about social media, they talk about search, and no one really talks about email anymore. But it's a hugely powerful digital tool at your disposal that we don't really see a lot of our clients using or certainly using well enough. Um, this is some stats from e-consultancy that basically say email is most, one of the most effective uh, digital marketing tools that you have. Um, and it comes in, the, I think from an ROI point of view, the best, even ahead of search, even ahead of social, which people don't really know if it generates ROI or not. Email is very, very attributable. And for a lot of our e-commerce clients specifically, when they send emails out, they get sales. And the cost of sending an email is very, very cheap in comparison to some of the other activities. So number one tip is to think about email. Um, because we all know, and it's, a, it's an anecdote, it costs about 10 times more to acquire a piece of business than to look after it. And again, this is stats provided by your consultancy. It says 70% you know, of people agree that it's much cheaper to look after an existing client than to buy new ones. So that's the thing from, from Love. We don't have to spend lots of money to show people that we care. We don't have to spend lots of money trying to woo people, um, we can do it quite cost effectively with some of the tools which are available. So second story is, uh, is love in a wider context in terms of friendship. <coughs> this is a story about swords. 
Uh, for those of you who are our clients, we sent this around, uh, a link to this article uh, in our uh, six month roundup. But it was a very interesting tale about a guy who was uh, a digital marketeer in America who lived with a flatmate. And they used to have this uh, sort of internal competition where they'd always try to get one up on themselves, whether it's a game of uh, FIFA on their PlayStation or um, something else. And this guy who got um, knocked by his housemates, he thought, I'm going to get some revenge, what can I do? And he knew that his friend got quite creeped out by the internet sometimes, he was slightly paranoid, um, but one of the things he loved doing was swallowing swords, believe it or not. Um, so this, this guy thought, well, how can I get this guy back? I'm going to use Facebook ads and I'm going to target my housemate using Facebook ads to try and creep him out by letting Facebook sort of show that they know that he likes swords swallowing. So the guy created a uh, campaign targeting 20 people, which is the smallest group you can target on Facebook. Uh, and you can pick out the names of people you want to target if you know who they are. So he created a group of 20 people, 19 of which were female, one of which was male, which was his friend. And he started targeting his friend using uh, adverts very, very specific to him that only he knew about some of the things that he was interested in. So he saw, and when his friend logged onto Facebook the next day, he saw an advert talking about how to swallow pills, because although he was very good at swallowing swords, he couldn't swallow pills. So this advert appeared in his friend's feed, basically offering him a solution to the, to the problem that he hadn't mentioned anywhere on the internet to anyone, but Facebook knew about it. Then it went on. Um, he was referred to as a strong top because he liked a very um, strong coffee. Advert appeared in his, in his feed about a week later. His friend got very creeped out. Well, how? I did not post anything about this. I only told you and someone else. Either you are <laughs> with me, or Facebook is absolutely eavesdropping on every private conversation via my phone. This guy was getting particularly paranoid because adverts were appearing in his feed that only his friend knew about, but he'd spoken about, and perhaps Facebook had been listening. The guy, Brian, completely denied it. No, it's not me, nothing to do with me. And on it, on, on it went. Hey, do you ever feel like your roommate's creating Facebook ads targeting you <laughs> just to freak you out? Eventually he came clean, and there's lots of profanity underneath this one as well, <laughs> uh, where he talks about um, what he did. But the, the point here is that we know a lot about people, uh, and with Facebook, a lot of information is given away, particularly um, with LinkedIn, with Twitter, Lots of information gets published. I talked about our digital footprints. You are probably not quite aware of how much information the internet, Google, etc., knows about you, but it's hugely powerful to target the right people at the right time using different channels. So if you know your audience really, really well, you could start to freak them out. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about doing an advert for my wife and just doing the same sort of thing for her, but I'll maybe not do that. I'll freak her out as well. Um, but we can target the 50, the 100, the 300 people that we really want to get in front of using some of the digital techniques that are out there. If I go onto Facebook now on my desktop, you have to again excuse my uh, friends for their language uh, if you get close enough to read it, but there are lots of adverts on here. And all of these are targeted at me. I didn't tell Facebook that I'm an entrepreneur. I didn't tell Facebook that um, I want to get a, a, a travel insurance. I'm not going on holiday, but... I certainly have interacted with American Express recently, and I've also looked at AO.com recently because I'm rebuilding my house and I've had to look at a lot of fridges and washing machines. So all of these adverts take up a huge amount of space in my feed. These businesses know who I am through hook or by crook, and they can target ads very, very specific at me. So if you are a brand that wants to get in front of people, yes, you can do search marketing, and yes, it's very, very powerful, but even Google will admit that search marketing in five years' time won't be search marketing what it is now, and it will be all be about audiences and all be about people. So the smarter and quicker we get at understanding our audiences, knowing who they are and where they are, um, we're going to win uh, much quicker than our competitors. So some information and, and tips there. Third story is 81 years. <coughs> this is a, a, a story about uh, a couple uh, called... Anne and John uh, Bater. There they are in 1932 getting married. They have been married for 81 years. They are America's longest married couple. I can't even imagine living to 81, let alone being married to my wife for 81 years, but these guys have done it. 
their story is that they never, they, they nearly never met, and they never, they nearly never married. When um, Anne was very young, her family wanted her to go and marry someone else. They had arranged the marriage for Anne, and they'd said, right, we want you to marry this guy. He was actually 20 years older than her, and I don't think she really liked him, or really even knew him. Um, but fortunately, she met uh, John, and John came along and swept her away, and they've been happily married ever since. So the story there is the fact that they never, they nearly never got married. They never had, they could have never had the life that they did. They could have never been married quite as long as they should have done. But it took uh, John's willpower to, to sway Anne away from um, her family and her friends and, and go away and get married. So my point here is that competitive, you're going to be in a competitive environment as, as John was. He had to try and win her against all the odds. Um, and there are ways and tricks in digital media that you can do similar thing. If you know that your, your audience is buying a particular competitor, you can target your competitor using a, a particular thing now in the Google um, AdWords system. So um, with search marketing, you can target particular keywords. With the Google AdWords platform now, you can target those keywords in people's emails. So if I know that a competitor, uh, one of my uh, potential audience, someone who could buy my products, has a newsletter from a competitor of mine, I can set up an advert which goes into their inbox using Google search display ads, um, which targets the, my competitors and hopefully tries to win them away from the competition. It's a slightly tenuous link, but I hope you get the idea that um, you can target your competitors either using search or now you can certainly use it using email of sorts to get in front of the people who you want to try and win business from. So that's an interesting thing. Fourth story about love. Um, I call maths. This guy um, is Chris McKinley. Chris is an uh, American guy, he's 35, or was 35, and he um, found love using di um, online dating. Most people nowadays have used online dating if you're a certain age, uh, and a lot of people have found love and even got married, and fortunately Chris did get married. But Chris had used the site called OkCupid for a number of years and hadn't had a huge amount of success. But the thing that Chris had was a degree in maths. He'd studied at one of the top universities in America, uh, and he could work numbers, and he could work big, what you would refer to as big data, if he, could ha if he had it. So Chris had been in these dating sites and knew that, yes, there's algorithms behind the scenes, but they're not producing the matches that I want. So Chris, in his uh, determined state of mind, said, oh, you know, I want to find a partner. Someone is out there for me. I just need to get them. So he set about basically scraping the whole of the uh, information from the OkCupid database using bots, using fake IDs, to collect six million pieces of information about females in the Los Angeles area. <laughs> Sounds quite scary, doesn't it? But he was determined and he had a, he had a degree in maths. And what he then did is he then drew some very interesting graphs that pulled um, the, the females that he'd collected, and that sounds very odd, um, <laughs> the data he'd collected into various buckets, and he then set about creating profiles to match the criteria of the women that matched his criteria to try and find a date. Uh, and after going through this um, various algorithms, pulling data, he eventually, uh, after 82 first dates, uh, met Christine uh, and then proposed to her after a year, and now they're going to get married. So the moral of the story there is that you know, we do have access to lots of data. As I mentioned before, we all have huge digital footprints, but what we tend to do is we treat everyone as the same. But we don't need to do that in these days. And then talked about email marketing, it's very easy to segment your database. With social marketing, it's very easy to actually um, segment people based on uh, demographics. But again, we don't really see a lot of our clients doing this. This is an example, I think, from eBay in terms of their categorization of their clients. Um, and there is ways now to even automate that. So if you know who your audiences are, there's a thing called programma programmatic advertising, which um, we've seen um, happen uh, in the last couple of years. We're not really doing a huge amount, but it will be a thing for 2015, where you can pick your audience. Your audience can get matched to various criteria on the internet with advertisers, which will then trigger an advert and will get tracked. And the whole process happens automatically with no, in, no input from you as an advertiser or you as a businessman or, or person. So this can happen by just defining your audience, getting very clear on your audience and who they are, and then letting the algorithms sort everything else out. So 
my tip here is to be very, very clear about your audience. If you don't know who they are, spend some time with someone who can put together information. Stuart did some information and research uh, manually, but certainly there's big information out there from a data point of view that you can get. Um, story number five, as I'm aware time is of the essence, is around limerence. So uh, limerence um, refers to being emotionally uh, engaged with someone, uh, and the Greek god of eros is uh, the, the god of love and god of passion. Limerence basically says that you love someone with all of your heart and you would give everything to be with them. And for us as brands, that's quite a powerful thing. If people love our brand, they will do everything to have it. Harley Davidson's probably the most uh, passionate, have the pa most, some of the most passionate sets of uh, consumers or uh, brand advocates out there to the point where you can get a Harley Davidson tattooed on your head. Similarly, you see the same sort of love for brands in the technology sector, where people will go to any sort of length to say that they love Apple. I've seen people with Apple tattoos. People queue up for days before Apple released products to go and buy them. And if you saw, if you saw the Australian guy uh, who bought the latest iPhone, you know everyone knows the story. He dropped the iPhone as soon as he got it, which is hugely hysterical. But um, people love Apple so much that they're prepared to, to queue up for days and days and days. So what is it about these brands that people love? Lots of information, lots of analysis has been done, but one of the, the biggest things that I got um, uh, told about a few years ago is a thing called Love Marks, and this is developed by Saatchi and Saatchi, where they looked at brands and they looked at why some people and some brands have got such huge respect and such huge love while others are just faddy or just consumer products and commoditized products that people don't really care about. I just buy a loaf of bread. I don't love Hovis. Why should I love Hovis? Why, do, but, um, why should I buy Hovis over any other bread? Why should I buy a Mac over a PC? There's no particular reason. They do the same function but there's a reason why people love particular brands. So what I think we need to be doing is trying to get, we're trying to create brands that people love. And typically there's a reason why we love a brand. Um, and if you've ever heard of a guy of si called Simon Sinek, if you haven't heard of him, I really suggest you look at him up on YouTube. He came up with this model called the Golden Circle. The Golden Circle basically says uh, there are three things to your business. Well, there should be three things what you do, how you do, and why you do it. And the way most businesses communicate is what. What do we do? We're Adido, we're a full service digital marketing agency based on the south coast of England. Well, there are lots of other full services digital marketing agencies in the south coast of England. Same way there are lots of companies that make MP3 players. But it's the why that we actually buy, and this is why, it's the why that people really buy into and people love. People buy Apple because they challenge the status quo. They create things which are lovely to touch, lovely to interact with, and they change people's lives. It just so happens that the thing that they change their lives with is the technology. Um, and the thing that Simon Sinek says is, you know, uh, when Martin Luther King said, um, you know, I have a dream, he wasn't saying, I, I want to do something. He was saying, I have a dream, I have something I believe in, I have something I'm passionate about, something really deep inside here that people then connected with. So Simon Sinek studied all these people and businesses and he said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I th again, th thinking about your business, you really do need to think about why you are here as a business. You know, we as Adido are here to make the lives of people happy using digital technology. That's why we are here. Just so happens the digital technology we use is stuff online, websites and things like that. But we could make the lives of people happy using digital technology building appliances, building things. The why can extend to many, many different areas of your business. But I think it's my challenge to you is to really think about why your business is here, ask some challenging questions, searching questions, and figure out what you can do. The sixth story is about Frappuccinos. <laughs> it's a quite diverse set of stories, but they all have a theme. Um, this was um, alerted to me by my colleague Andrew, who's given me the five minute sign at the back. I asked him about lo love stories, which ones do you know about, and he pointed me in this direction. This is a story of a, a real-time love, in, in effect. Someone was sat in Starbucks one day, on their, on their Mac, of course, um, and someone came along in Starbucks, saw the person, saw the Mac address of the, of the person they um, were looking at, and they were quite attracted to them. So they put a, created a Word doc, put it into the shared drive of the person who was at Starbucks, and it popped on their screen. 
and it said, I'm at Starbucks right now, and some person with the Mac just put this Word document into my airdrop. And it said, um, will you go out with me? <laughs> Her friend then said, did you say yes? My response was, if you buy me a Frappuccino, I'm yours. <laughs> this happened on real time on a, on a chat room. What happened? They just called out for a Frappuccino for swag money. Uh, that's the name of my computer on airdrop. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Real-time digital love happened in Starbucks thanks to a Frappuccino. My point here is that digital is a 24-7 is a thing. I already mentioned that we live our lives virtually constantly online. There's some stat to say that we check our phones about 160 times a day, which you think, that's not right, it can't be. I challenge you, for the next 24 hours, see how many times you check your phone. It will be a scary amount. So if you are a brand and you have people talking about your brand and your services online, you need to be reacting to get the best advantage, get that um, one step in front of your competitor. The example of this here is um, this guy called Chris Ramsey, I've not heard of, apparently he's fun with the kids. Uh, and he was talking about, I'm on a train and I want to get some pizza. And people read Chris Ramsey's tweets and said, yeah, come on someone, give him some pizza. And literally within minutes, this whole hashtag pizza on a train had been developed and people started tweeting saying pizza on a train, pizza on a train. And Domino's saw the conversation happening, whether it was by chance or maybe it was slightly planned, I don't know. Uh, and sure enough, within an hour of him tweeting, I want a pizza on a train, Domino's arrived, gave him some pizzas, he tweeted it, oh look, there's the Domino brand name in front of uh, 3,750 people who retweeted it and nearly 5,000 people who favorited it. Real-time conversations were happening, frappuccinos, pizzas, people were there listening, people were there reacting, people were there getting their brand in front of others. That sounds like a lot of effort as a small business owner or even a, a person in a marketing team perhaps. There are shortcuts you can take. So this is a, a service called IFT, if you've not heard of it, it's it stands for if this, then that, which basically means you can program the internet to do stuff if stuff happens. So if you have a hashtag that you want to follow, let's say let's do digital, you can follow it in your Twitter feed and you can see that. Um, but if it will allow you to then send you a text message if certain criteria are met, or it can send a message to your Twitter if something happens, or you can program something. So you can monitor stuff, see what happens without actually having to do a huge amount of work. As I say, there are other tools like um, TweetDeck, where you can create a, a monitor, a live feed of stuff, either hashtags or keywords, so you can keep an eye on things very easily. Um, and my point here, you know, it's very important to do this, particularly if you're a customer-facing organisation. If you have a customer service channel in your business, then um, you need to monitor it. I was looking to buy a fridge recently, uh, hire UK online service, I was hoping to them to give me the measurements of the space I needed around the fridge, so I tweeted them, and I also tweeted Curry's um, to ask some questions. Curry's came back to me. Hire service has had one tweet which says, if you've got a complaint, this is the email address you need to go to. They're not listening, they're not paying attention, and do you know what happened? I ended up buying a Bosch fridge instead. They couldn't answer my question in, in the, you know, I'm not expecting five seconds, but certainly I'm expecting something quick. The best example of customer service done online and digital is Zappos. If you've ever read about or heard about Zappos, customer service is the number one thing. They are on social media, they are listening to people, and they've got 109,000 favourites from all of the great stuff, great community that they've created. Uh, a couple more stories to, just to finish off. Uh, number seven is check-in. This guy, Mark Goulston, is a, uh, a professor, study, studier of many things, um, one of which is relationships. And he created, uh, if you want to download the slides, you can read them, the 10 habits of happy cu cu uh, couples. And there are many things in here which you can take away and share with your partner and try and work on. Um, number nine I picked out is to do a weather check during the day. If you have a partner and you want to create a happy relationship with your partner, just do a check-in once a day. How are you? How's things? If someone's had a bad day, then you know when they come home, they're going to be in a bad mood, rather than you opening the front door. Oh my God, what's happened? <laughs> do a weather check during the day, and your, your relationship should improve. Um, and perhaps we should be doing the same as businesses as well. How often do we speak to our existing customers? How often do we ask them 
how they are, how's business, how's my website. There are tools that you can use for free. This one here is called uh, 4Q because it asks four questions. It's not a rude uh, term. They ask four questions and you can take it and put it on your website, ask people, did you find what you want on my website today, give some feedback and um, collect it. You just check in with your audience, check in with your customers and it's very easy to collect information. Okay, we don't like these pop-ups and only a couple of people or percents will actually fill it in. But it gives you real insight into what people like, what they're struggling with and for you to then act on to try and improve your customer service. If you sell products online, there are many services like this. This is one I picked up called FIFO. Again, when someone's purchased a product, it sends an automated email. Can you ask us what you thought about our product and our service? You know, where can we improve? If you've got 95% um, excellent results, then fantastic, you're doing something really great. But there may be some nuggets in there that you can just tweak in your offering to help um, push you. The ultimate is a thing called Net Promoter Score, which we run ourselves, or uh, CBI which basically looks at how many people are not bothered about your brand or won't recommend you versus those that do. And from that, you get a good idea about how, how well you're performing. Uh, in the banking sector, there are many uh, bad NPS scores, which basically means most people don't care about or like their banks. And there are only two that people do care or like about. Anyone to guess who they are? Nationwide. Nationwide one and? That West note. Santander note. First Direct, well done. So only two banks have got more people that would recommend them to their friends than not. So the banking industry's got something to do. But you can get some of this information. Some businesses publish their standards of their NPS score, and you can benchmark yourself to see where you're going. And the final story I leave you with is a personal one. It's called Rhino. For those of you that are frequenting Southampton Town Centre, uh, or used to back in the day, we'll, would have heard of the Rhino Club maybe? Not the greatest place in the world, to be honest. I used to go there occasionally with my friends. Um, and that's actually where I met my wife, in the Rhino Club. I didn't go there very often, but I did, after going to the cricket here one day, end up going to the Rhino Club, I met my wife. And the, one of the reasons why I met my wife, obviously my stunning good looks, but um, I did um, many voices for her. I was quite drunk and I started doing impressions and I started to try and make her laugh. And I grew up on a diet of Harry Enfield with scousers. Alice, Alice, calm down, calm down. Um, people like Dave Angel from The Fast Show or Colin Hunt from The Fast Show. These are people that had um, lots of different uh, aspects of their personality. I picked up on some of this humour uh, and I managed to woo my wife with it. The message here is that humour can actually win when it comes to communicating with our audience. We can show our love for them by understanding them and, and just making them laugh. Um, there are many examples of you know, brands that do funny things, uh, Oreo you know, on the piggy, but they pick it back on lots of things that happen around the world and they create something that's fun, you know, you're going to share it, it's, it's quite interesting, you're going to laugh. Paddy Power have got a, a, a Facebook social media presence that has won awards, basically because they m make stupid things, they make people laugh and they take the piss out of people quite a lot. But has won them awards, it's got them you know, here for example, 3,000 likes where um, they created a graphic about saying about how great Luis Suarez was um, <laughs> by Brendan Rodgers, but then obviously he was then studying Diego Costa, so if you know about football. <laughs> so a bit of humour can really help the world go around. It doesn't have to be cutting. It can be something, again, very you know, light. This is light humour. But again, it's targeted to the audience. Southwest Airlines most likely to be parents flying on their aircraft. Nice picture of a boy in a cut-out plane. You know, it's slightly funny, and it's, it's um, aligned to that. You can also go the James Blunt route, where basically you don't give a toss about what anyone thinks about you, and you're quite happy to slag anyone and everyone off. I leave you to read that, because I don't think I need to. <laughs> there are many, many more. Check them out. <coughs> so that's a story about rhinos, um, and the fact that humour can help spread love, help spread our message. Um, and that's it, really. So eight stories of love. There are nine days to Valentine's, eight evenings, so use one per day if you want to. Uh, just to summarise, so when it comes to the love and thinking about our customers and our brands, you know, be committed, love your existing customers, spend time getting to know them, <coughs> advertise to them, communicate with them, check in with them, make sure that you're understanding them, listening to them and hopefully having better relationships. Um, take time, these relationships take time to develop, you know, your part, the relationship with your partner didn't happen overnight, the relationship with your audience, your customers won't happen overnight, so keep working at things and, and have fun and I'll leave you with that. Um, hope you've enjoyed my talk. Hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, look forward to seeing you all.
throughout the course of the day. Thanks a lot.